Good evening. We are glad that you are here. We gather in the growing darkness this evening, not only uh, of this night, but in this week of Holy Week. Our Lenten journey has brought us here. And Jesus, our teacher and our Lord, sets before us a towel, a bowl, bread, and a cup. And he gives us an example and a commandment ever new to love one another as he has loved us. For this is how everyone will know that we are his disciples. Would you stand and let us sing together our opening hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. As Jesus and the disciples gathered so long ago uh, during the festival of Passover around that last supper table, so shall we tonight gather around God's table and we will celebrate the Eucharistic meal. Would you hear this invitation to Holy Communion? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another with the prayer of confession as printed in your bulletin this evening. Holy God, you have called us to serve others as Christ has served us. We confess that we have not followed the example of Christ as fully or as often as we should. We turn away from people in need. We hide our own vulnerability before others. 
You have commanded us to love one another as you have loved us. We confess that we have not loved so generously. Gathered together on this holy Thursday, we confess that we are all capable of denying and betraying you and one another, no less than the first disciples. Forgive us, merciful God, and cleanse us of all our sin. Then guide our feet to walk with you always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Disciples of Jesus Christ, having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus loved them to the end. Jesus knows us fully and offers love and forgiveness unconditionally. In gratitude for the grace given to us, and as a witness to our faith in Christ, we will love one another. The peace of Christ be with you. As ones who are forgiven and reconciled to God, it is our responsibility to go from this place and to show that peace of Christ in our homes, at school, in our work. It is up to us. Let us rise to the challenge. If not us, then who? On this holy evening, we turn to the words of Scripture. We'll begin in the Old Testament with the reading from Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 through 4, and then 11 through 14. It's found printed in your bulletin, and I hope that you will hear these words from the Hebrew Scriptures. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. This is how you shall eat it, with your loins girded and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hands, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for the Lord will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And now for our gospel reading, we invite you to stand as you are able as we hear from the gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and then following with verses 31 through 35. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. 
Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he had put on a robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And continuing, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I know that often when we gather together in Holy Week, in the months of sometimes March, but most of the time in April, it's not as cold as it is tonight. It's cold and it is windy. It's not the kind of Holy Week or the week before the Masters that we normally expect, is it? Right now, my wife, Julie, is at a baseball game because my son is playing And she is bundled up with a sweatshirt and another coat on the outside. Watching him play baseball, she sent me a picture of her tonight with teeth chattering, saying, is it warm in the sanctuary? (laughs) Pretty much. Probably could be a little warmer. Years ago, when my wife, Julie, uh, joined the staff at Birmingham Southern College, she was interviewed by... General Krulak, Chuck Krulak. He was the president of Birmingham Southern College several years ago. And you would think that somebody would be intimidated going and interviewing in front of someone like a general for a job, right? She didn't really care if it was a general or if it was somebody who worked at Dollar General. It was a person. And there she was interviewing with this man who was on the Joint Chiefs of Staff back in one of the Republican um, uh, administrations years before. Here he was, this man of immense power who had sat in some of the, uh, the highest places in our country, and she's interviewing for a job as a chaplain in a college, which she got, probably easily. But what stands out about this man, this general, who probably commanded thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people is the kind of life that he lived on the college campus because when the students, the freshmen, moved into their dorms at the beginning of the semester, the staff was supposed to go and help the students move in. They would carry in luggage. They would carry in television sets and computers They would carry in many, many things into these dorms. My wife was one of those people, carrying things in, handing out water to people because it can get pretty hot in August here in Alabama. But this general, who could have delegated this task to so many people at that college, was one of the people who would show up, roll up his sleeves, 
and get to work. Because serving these students was not something he did because it would show off his greatness to the college. Serving these students was a part of the very character and the very ethics that he wanted to have last in their memory that no one is above anyone else and that we all must serve one another. We all must serve one another. This is a concept known as servant leadership. Servant leadership, that if we want to lead people, we have to serve them and help them and gain their trust. But we also have to demonstrate for others what they should be doing. Years ago, when I was uh, at a school for pastors, not seminary, but it was at a church and we were learning how to be great pastors, I know you're wondering if I should get my money back for that class. But one of the things they said was, is that pastors should park, uh, if they're able, at the other end of the parking lot, and as they come in to work, they should always pick up every piece of trash that they see in the parking lot. And you might think, well, why do that? Because you're trying to model servant leadership. If you do it, then hopefully everybody else will do it. I'm telling these, you these stories because on one sense, Jesus seems to be the perfect example of servant leadership. But I want to say that he's not doing it just to teach the disciples how to be effective evangelists. He's not doing it just so that they can earn the trust of the people that they're going to go and share the message with. He's not trying to give them a good leadership course at the Last Supper. Instead, he's demonstrating for them something that is so important about the gospel that we've got to understand that we have to make sense of if we are going to continue to follow Jesus all the way. St. Paul talks a little bit about this. St. Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 12, beautiful verse, verses 1 through 2, about how, friends, we have got to be the kind of people who present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's our spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to the world. You've heard this before, I'm sure. Some of these passages are even part of our Holy Communion liturgy. But Paul continues. And when Paul continues, he says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to you. Don't think of yourself too highly, but serve with the measure of grace that God has given to you. As Paul continues in this wonderful chapter, he talks about how the, the church itself is the body of Christ and how we are all members of that one body and each of us has an important role. You see, Jesus is trying to show them the meaning of what it means to understand that we are servants of the gospel, not just servant leaders. I think that is primarily what Jesus is trying to demonstrate. Not just that they are servant leaders who are going to take over the church once Jesus is crucified tomorrow, after he uh, comes from the empty tomb on Sunday and goes up after Pentecost, or at, before Pentecost to heaven. It's not just about them taking over at Pentecost as leaders of the church. It's about becoming the people who are able to take the message of Jesus and pass it on well. Paul says that we should not think more highly of ourselves, but we should see ourselves as part of the body of Christ, as members together, and we serve one another. And we serve one another so that we can be people transformed by that powerful love and we can communicate the gospel and live it together. When I have read this passage over and over and over again, Year after year, because it's the same passage almost every year from Monday Thursday, I've always thought about how, how 
important it is for us as people in a church to love one another and that unity and that service is so very important. That's one reason why we often have a foot washing service after this service or as a part of this service where people can come and wash each other's feet so that we can be connected to each other. It's a beautiful, important time. And then of course, we can't do it right now unless instead of water, we used hand sanitizer. But friends, once this is over, it will be back. But that moment of washing each other's feet is a beautiful metaphor, a beautiful sign of what it means for us to love one another, that we should always approach one another as members of the household of faith, members of the body of Christ. We should love one another. We should bring a towel and a basin to every meeting that we have. Now, I'm not saying that every time we have a meeting, we're going to have a foot washing service. What I mean is, is that we should always be seeking to serve one another. The towel and basin are a symbol of what it means to truly love one another. But then, Angela ruined that for me this week. <laughs> because in our podcast that I'm sure that everybody's been listening to, we were reading a book by Walter Brueggemann, a famed Old Testament scholar, who said in this text, and Angela talked about it in the podcast, that Christians need to be the kind of people who take a towel and a basin into the world. Into the world. Outside of the walls of the church. We need to take that servant mindset, not just to one another in our love, but we need to take it outside. And that got me thinking. It was a good kind of ruining. It got me thinking about how many times I've missed the point, again, of what Jesus is trying to say. It's not just about servant leadership and about building bonds of faith and love within people who are already in the church together. It's also about taking the gospel outside the walls. It's also about taking the healing, loving action that we are called to live with outside of the walls. It's about mission. It's about service. But it's sacrificial mission and service. It is self-giving. It is, of course, doing all we can to love our neighbor as ourselves. I thought about Chuck Krulak, General Krulak, serving those students. And then I just had this image in my mind of him leaving the campus of Birmingham Southern and taking all the faculty and going through the community and doing all these good works in the name of, of God. And I know that we do some of that in missions. I know I've seen people this past week who have come in from the fields, from the communities, who have been serving those affected by the tornadoes, those who are hungry, those who have been isolated and they've been delivering meals to them at home because they could not come to church and be with one another. I know we've done these things, but I want to tell you that this dawned on me how important it is for us to continue to do this because we should not think so highly of ourselves that we should only love the people that we want to love or that we're surrounded by or that we sit by in a pew we need to think of ourselves as part of a family whose job it is to take the message given to us by our God, by our Father, by our Savior, and to take it where it needs to go. Jesus told us that he came to those who are sick because the people who are well don't need a doctor. The sick do. Now, the truth of the matter is, we all know all of us are sick in a way. We all need him as a doctor. But oh my goodness, did he not go to where the sickest were? The most ill, the most in need? Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He commands them to love one another. But I don't think that's the full commandment. I think the full commandment the full commandment that Jesus gives us is to love like Jesus loves. 
It starts with the way we love one another. It starts with the way that we love people within the church, within our families. It starts there. But it cannot stay there. The love of God could not be isolated to a house, an upper room, where they met and instituted the Last Supper together, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. That love could not be contained by the hill of Golgotha, where Jesus, we remember, will be crucified tomorrow. That love could not be contained to Israel and the people of God. No, that love continued to expand to Gentiles like you and to me. That message expanded throughout the world. Because the full commandment is to love like Jesus. Let's take that towel and basin, that bread and that cup, and let's serve one another. Let's take care of one another. But let's not stop there. The love of God cannot be contained within walls. It's got to keep going out. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Holy and loving God, may your grace be given to us. May it flow through us, but may it runneth over. May it spill out so that that love can be shared again and again and again with all who need it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in him your crowning gift emptying himself that our joy might be full. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we have prayed is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Thanks be to God.
Amen. The feast has been prepared, and you are invited to come forward and receive. Uh, as you come forward to receive, you also have the opportunity to give to the pastor's discretionary fund, and you may place those gifts in the basket or, or on the altar. Uh, those of you who are sitting in the outside sections, if you will exit your pews toward the wall and come to the table and receive the elements. Those of you who are sitting in the center sections, if you will empty out into the center aisle and come forward and receive. I would ask that after you pick up your elements, if you will take them back to your seat, and if you will wait for all to have um, the elements and let us all partake together. You are invited to come. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Thank you, holy God, for giving us this meal, shared in the Spirit, which sustains us with the food and drink of your life. Grace our lives that we may at the last come to share in the heavenly banquet in your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, let us all stand together and sing hymn number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This? <coughs>
As we conclude this evening's service, I want to remind you that we will have a Holy Week service tomorrow night here again in the sanctuary, and it will be live streamed as well at 7 o'clock p.m. It will be a service of tenembrae, uh, a night of sorrows as we see the lights extinguish and the darkness uh, encroach in on Jesus and around Jesus as we read the scriptures together. I hope you will join us for this very special service tomorrow evening. And then, of course, eat, join us on Easter Sunday. The times are on the back, of course, if, of your bulletin if you want to find out more uh, about those services. If you have someone in your life that could not make it tonight and you want to take communion to them and you're in person, we invite you at the end of the service to come and take uh, some elements with you. For those of you who couldn't be with us, we want to remind you we will have an opportunity for you to come and have communion at the church in the following week. Friends, on this night so long ago, Jesus did eat dinner, a Passover meal with his disciples. They sat around the table as Jesus washed their feet, as Jesus lifted up the bread and the cup. It was on this night that he was betrayed in the garden where the disciples fell asleep. They couldn't stay up as Jesus was praying fervently to God. It was his last night before the cross. As we leave tonight, let us remember the deep heart and the great love of God as we see Jesus himself offering up his own life for us. May God, who led Israel out of slavery and into freedom, may Christ, who led us out of death and into life, and may the Holy Spirit who leads us out of fear and into boldness abide with you this holy Thursday and in the holy days ahead and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.